At one point, we flew straight up into the air, cut the engine and fell back down. It was just one of the most exhilarating things that I've ever experienced. And then the pilot kindly gave me control and let me fly. So we were going upside down and I was flying it. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, trying to help you find adventure every day in any stage of life. You're going to hear from explorers, adventurers, business owners, and anyone living their life a little more out of the box than usual. I cannot believe it's already August 1st. Like 2019 is well over halfway over. That is crazy to me. Honestly, it gives me a little anxiety. <laughs> and about two years ago, we uh, talked to a lady on the show, Paula McGuire, who had faced 30 years of crippling social anxiety to where her only place of refuge was her own home and nothing outside of that. And she used adventure to break out of that. And uh, her story is this interview, and it's a great one, and we wanted to replay it because for a lot of us, I know, um, you know, school starting back up for kids. Summer's going to be wrapping up, you know, in a couple weeks or a month or so for you. And anxiety has got a hold of a lot of us. I know it does. To the point where we're, you know, scared to take risks, scared to take trips. What if my body doesn't hold up? What if I can't afford it? What if, what if, what if? But when you take on adventure and you do adventure, you begin to not worry so much about things because you, you see just how resourceful you are and tough situations, or just really what life is actually about. You appreciate things when you get home a little bit more. And you also become more content with what you accomplish, you know? There's so many good things to adventure, and decreasing your anxiety is just one of many. Hope you enjoy this episode. Hope you learn something from it. and Hope you become the hero of your own life. And uh, yeah, let's make this month the best month the show's ever had. Part of the folks making that happen is our sponsors. So thank you, Athletic Brewing and CS Instant Coffee for making this show happen. And, uh, you know, if you got some extra money this month, please support them. They'll mail some stuff to you. They'll mail some beer. They'll mail some coffee to you. And we'll keep cranking out these interviews. All right, let's do it. Hello again, friends. Thanks again for listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast. And, well, I have a, a fun show that I think is going to be very beneficial for a lot of us today. I have Paula McGuire from Scotland, and Paula has such an amazing story to tell about how she used adventure to overcome some extreme anxiety issues that were debilitating, and it's given her a new life and so much hope and encouragement and inspiration for so many others. So Paula McGuire is on the phone today, and I'm really excited to hear her story. Paula, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Kurt. I'm really excited to talk to you. Well, we're excited to hear what you have to share. I know that what you've been doing has been so wonderful, setting the example for so many others on overcoming adversity. And I love shows like this because the reality is, I, I forget who the artist was, like 20 years ago, who had a song called Equal Scary People. Did you ever hear that? No, I don't know that one. Well, it, the, the message of the song was exactly that. It was just that everybody has their own challenges, and it, yeah. it's completely normal for people to have challenges. That's what life is. But when someone like yourself comes out and says, hey, this was my particular challenge, and this is what worked for me, I think that it helps so many people. So I'm really, really excited. Hope so. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fantastic. But we got to start with Scotland. So you live in <laughs> Glasgow. I do. I live in Glasgow in Scotland. I was born here and um, and yeah, I never, haven't ever moved. I love it here. Mm. And how do you find Scotland as far as uh, an adventure location? Does that work? Yeah, Scotland's incredible. We're we're known for outdoors. You know, we've got we've got hills, we've got the sea always nearby. There's there's locks. There's pretty much everything that you could you need for an outdoor adventure. Um, I live in, as you say, Glasgow, which is the biggest city in Scotland, but I'm only 20 minutes drive away from or or 40 minutes cycle away from uh, some of the most beautiful scenery and you know hills and and yeah we're we're really lucky for for outdoors in, in Scotland and I feel like I really missed out on that for a long period of my life but I'm making up for it now. Mm. Well let's go back 
to how this all kind of started. So you grew up in Glasgow, and Scotland is home. Yeah. But at some point, anxiety started becoming a major challenge in your life. How did that develop? I think that I would love to say that there was just one point that anxiety, you know, just raised its head and I, I remember it. But I've I've suffered with anxiety since I was maybe about four or five years old. So so really, really young. I remember being more nervous about things than than other kids. And I was always I was always told and I always told myself that it was just part of my personality. You know, I was just a nervous person. I was a shy person. I was really bookish and academic and very introverted. So I grew up with that and I grew up with that story about myself. You know, the way that you do, you you have this story about yourself that you're always told. And I grew up knowing that, um, that I was shy and that I was nervous. When I got to maybe my teenage years, so maybe about 13, 14 I was already on medication for anxiety. I had lots of twitches. So I do things like I blink a lot and um, I would shake my head a lot. And you can imagine how how well that <laughs> that worked in high school. I got bullied really badly for, oh. for, for being so anxious. And it just kind of built and built and built to the only the only things that I could really do when I got to my adult years was go to work and come back. And I started just cutting out absolutely everything else in life. Mm. So how did it manifest itself? You mentioned social anxiety particularly. So yeah. was it, it was it a fear of people or a fear of ridicule? Or how did it manifest in your life? Yeah, I always say social anxiety is a fear of people, but it's not that you're you're not frightened of people, you know, jumping out from behind a behind the, the next corner with an axe or anything. You you don't ever fear for your life. You fear for um, it's people's judgment and what people think of you, and that's a really natural response. We are um, really social beings, and and we want to fit in, and um, it's really normal. So please don't think you have social anxiety if you worry about what people think a little. But for me, it became that I worried so much about people's judgment that I just stopped trying. I stopped putting myself in situations that um, that I could potentially fail or that I might be laughed at. So, but that became everything. So I couldn't. I could no longer eat in public. So I couldn't go for for family dinners or anything like that. I couldn't answer the telephone. Um, even answering my front door became really, really difficult. So I got to about. 30 and and I had tried pretty much everything else that I could to overcome this and it just became that I needed to do something for myself. Mm. Well I want to dive into the details of that in just a second but you brought something up that I want to address for the listeners out there especially. You mentioned how the kids in high school were hard on you because of the anxiety that they saw and it just it just made the problem worse. Of course. And uh, I realized a while back, I call it naming, and I don't mean calling people names, although that that, that causes issues, right? But mm-hmm. naming is when we adopt something to be real about ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, our parents give us our given names, right? And sometimes that name is, it, it really, it, it reflects our personality and who we think we are, and sometimes it doesn't. But that's not even really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when people are growing up and someone says... Well, you're just lazy. Would you help out some more? You know what I mean? And yeah, especially and that sticks if, with you. If it's someone that you respect, then that can become a, a little parasite in yeah, your psyche. And it, it just it, it sticks with you and it just never goes. So when I was, you know, when I was four and I was shy, and that's quite cute when you're small and, you know, you're, you're just a little, little thing. And I would hide behind my family and my sister would speak for me and things. And and that stuck with me. People always from that point onward said, oh, she's the shy one. So my sister was the sociable one. Um, she's very gregarious, very outgoing, very sporty. And, and I was always the shy one. And that I told myself that over and over and over again until by the time I was in my 20s, I, if you had asked me what kind of person I was, I wouldn't have said that I'm a kind person or that I'm good hearted or anything. I would have told you that I was a nervous or an anxious person. It'd become what I thought was the biggest part of my personality, which is just so unhealthy. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's the message I wanted to get out, that all of us have been named by teachers, by parents, by siblings, by friends. And some of those names are wrong. They're inaccurate. Mm -hmm. 
We never should have adopted them as part of who we are. And it, it's about being who we are. I am. The you are yeah. are what get us in trouble. We've got to start saying, I am. And then name not just what we see happening in our lives, but you can say things that you really want to be. And it's true. And the reason I say that is people feel like they're lying when they say something that they want to be and they're not sure that they are. They get this in, internal conflict. And I don't want to get too much psycho babble going, but I just want to get this message out. When you say, I am, and you name what you really want to be, there is a part of you that is that, or you wouldn't want to be it. And so it's legitimate. You can claim that you are that, and if you do that over and over again, you will become that, and then it'll be manifest in your life. I absolutely agree, and I I love that you've said that. I am a great believer these days that we are not one thing you know from day to day I am I'm a horrible moody you know difficult to live with person or I'm a good natured you know lovely kind person it it's just how how you act on it and how you respond to it and how you are day to day I'm just nowadays I'm not you know, I'm not anxious. I struggle with anxiety still, but nowadays I am Paula, who is a person in her own right and who is bigger than all these tiny little parts of her personality or conditions that she's dealing with. And I think that's the only way that we can we can kind of move forward is by telling ourselves that, you know, I'm day to day, I'm just Paula and I'm just trying to get through life the best I can, just the same as everybody else. Absolutely. And <laughs> I've got to say this, Paula, I love it. Um, we're the Adventure Sports Podcast. We have a lot of people that listen to the show because they go out and do amazing feats. And there we have some of the greatest people on the show. But I don't care how tough, how big, how secure, how amazing somebody is. They still have their own challenges, too. And this is for everybody out there. So, listeners, I don't care how tough you might think you are. You know <laughs> that part of you that's eating at you that you would like to overcome. Well, you can do that. And Paula gave us a beautiful example of how to overcome some serious challenges through adventure. So, okay, Paula, you said you were around 30, and you said, I just can't do this anymore. Um, You decided to to grab the bull by the horns, and just explain to us exactly how that worked for you. Yeah, um, as I say, I got to I got to thirty, and you know that way when you're young and you think that there's something else I should be doing. You know, I'm going to I'm going to change the world. I'm I'm going to help people, and and I just wasn't doing that. And I thought this isn't the life that I should be that I should be leading. I was at that point. Um, I was working, and I was married, uh, but that was all. I wasn't doing anything else. I, I was I would come home at the end of the day and, and that would be it. I would shut the door, breathe a sigh of relief and that would be it. And um, I had tried everything external to myself to beat the anxiety. You know, I'd, I'd gone I'd gone to everyone that I, that I thought could help. I'd, I'd been on medication for a long time. I'd, I'd had counselling and therapy and hypnotherapy and I think I'd have you know gone for an exorcism if if my mother had allowed me you know I I tried everything and it just became that there was there was only me left to try there was there was no one else that could that could really do it for me so before something really drastic happened because that was the next step it would probably have been hospitalization or me doing myself some real drastic damage with the amount of medication that I was Mm, taking just to get through a day um something had to give so I thought that if somebody was going to make a decision about my mental health and about my future then it should be me so I gave myself one last chance to kind of frighten myself (laughs) out of the anxiety which sounds really stupid but um I became Paula must try harder that's that's my blog, Jenny, Jenny, my husband, set up a blog for me called Paula Must Try Harder. And I started to challenge myself to big, scary things, to kind of try and put the fear into context and and maybe prove to myself that I was bigger than the anxiety. Mm. And you've done that through a series of, of uh, what would you say, a series of, of programs, <laughs> maybe a program's yeah. not the right word, but it started out I mean, with maybe... 17 sports and then yep. uh, doing jobs that children want and then <laughs> um, an adventure per week. And so yep. from that grew this huge collection of adventures and blogs and uh, YouTube videos, and by the way, listeners, go to paulamusttryharder.co.uk, and you can see this, what I'm talking about. 
But Paula now has uh, shared these experiences so that you can see what she did. So Paula, explain how all that worked. So I started off really, really um, small. For most of your your listeners who are very outdoorsy and very active, they probably won't understand what I did the, with the first the first challenge. My first challenge was to try the seventeen Commonwealth sports. So we have the Commonwealth Games, and um, you know, like the Olympics, it, it travels around. So it was coming to Glasgow. It was coming to my hometown, and there was seventeen sports involved, and I hadn't tried any of them because sports to me were really frightening they were really performative and people watched you doing them and there was so much chance to make a mistake or you know to be the rubbish one and I I would never get picked for teams or or at sports day so I just avoided them so I thought let's try all 17 of these sports from scratch and just see if it helps with my physical health with my mental health and just with how I I felt about myself and just to kind of reconnect with the world I suppose so I started off learning to ride a bike what age did you learn to ride a bike at Kurt (laughs) oh I think I was three or four I was 31 wow 31 yeah I just I'd never had an interest in having a bike my sister could ride a bike but um I, I just didn't didn't fancy it. I was it was too scary. So I started off with that, and then I moved on to different sports. And by the end up, I was training in judo with Olympic athletes and playing rugby with the Scottish rugby squad, and you know, um, playing squash with the the Commonwealth team. So it just took off because there was such a buzz around the city and around the country at that time about this big event that that people just got involved because I was so rubbish. <laughs> I was so bad at all the sports and it just gave people a reason to or an excuse I suppose to go out and just be rubbish at sports as well because I'm a big um you know I really believe in that you don't have to be good at things to go out and try them in fact you should do the things that you're worst at because it's where you have most to develop Uh, so that's kind of where it started and that's where it, it took off for me and I now have this is what I do day to day now. I'm um, I'm an adventurer by by trade, I suppose these days, which is incredible. Yeah, that is so cool. Let's unpack this just as an example. You started by riding a bike. Yeah, you're 31, so you have you have fresh memories of it. I barely remember learning to ride a bike, but you can tell <laughs> us what it was like. But what were you nervous about when you first tried? Who did you have help you? And what was the impact that very first day? <laughs> They, well, you say the very first day, but it actually took me almost three months to learn to ride a bike. And I know that that, that probably sounds quite funny. Um, but for the first three weeks, I couldn't go into the centre and ask for lessons because that was my first challenge. I thought I'll start with cycling because it's a solo sport and I won't have to talk to people. So I bought a bike and I went out in my, my back garden and I just couldn't do it. It just it wasn't there. I didn't have those skills. So I knew that I had to go in and ask somebody for help. But for me, that was terrifying because it was it was bringing up all that social anxiety. So every day after work, I would go and I would sit outside the centre and I would come home and I would lie and say, oh, it was closed today or, oh, they couldn't, they couldn't help me today. And <laughs> event, <laughs> you know, just, just lie. And I, I knew that I was lying and, and my husband knew that I was lying. But eventually one weekend he, he said, you know, if you're going to start this, Paula, you really need to start it. So he came with me and, and I wouldn't let him come I let him come into the centre with me, but I wouldn't let him come out to take photos for the blog. So he had to hide in bushes <laughs> to take photos of me, God bless him, <laughs> so, so, so that I had a record. Um, and yes, of course they didn't laugh at me. They they had adults learning to cycle all the time. This is, to me, I was the only person in the world that this that this was the problem for. But no, they had loads of people there and, and they taught me and it took a long time. And I still fall off my bike, but it was the first day that it all went in the right order that the pedals started going and I had my hands in the handlebars and I was traveling under my own speed it was one of the most incredible moments of my life and I think I probably did shed a tear or two because it was the first time that I'd challenged myself to something that I did not know what the outcome would be Um, I'd always stuck to things that I knew that I could do like going to university and things because I knew that that I could study and that would be fine but but cycling was one of those things that I didn't know if it would ever go right, but I stuck with it. And the pride that I felt, I, I can still feel it welling up in me just now. I don't know if you can hear it, but um, 
the pride that I felt at that at that point was so much bigger than the anxiety and and it really bolstered me to keep going Mm. so when you you conquered it you overcame all the challenges and the fears and it's not just learning to ride a bicycle it was the challenge of actually (laughs) interacting with people who are going to help you learn to ride a bicycle it was (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know it was all of that um you finished that first thing and you said i can ride a bike i've done it Mm -hmm. and uh so then was it like, okay, this is working, I'm I'm free, I'm 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 not gonna stop now, or or was it still difficult? It was that that whole challenge the, the doing the sports was two years and it was two years of me crying pretty much every single day. Um there's lots of lovely photos of me, you know, trying netball for the first time with a big smile on my face and um learning to play hockey and and they look really, really happy. But there were there were days that I could not get out of my bed. You know, I, I just I, I was really, really struggling because it wasn't just learning something new all the time. It was learning to to do it in spite of the fear. And fear is it has such control over us, you know, and and it takes a long time to break through that, especially if you've been living with it for such a long time and you've you've convinced yourself that it's part of you and that you have to take it everywhere that you go. So there were days, um, there were really, really low points. And at the start of the challenge, when on my blog, I was just writing about trying sports as a clumsy adult. And I hadn't really admitted that I had this, this anxiety and these mental health issues that were bearing down on me. But the first time that I admitted that, and it was after a, a terrible session of badminton in which I'd had a panic attack and cried, mm. um, and I, I got Jerry to take a photo of me just in an absolute mess, and I put it on the blog, and it was it got the biggest response that I had ever had because people eventually people had finally realised that I wasn't just doing this to be funny, that I was doing it because I needed it, because I needed to break this this mental health problem and and I was doing it for a really good reason and people just got behind it and that for me was incredible it was such a turnaround because I was scared of people I didn't think that people would accept me and then here was these people that I didn't know getting in touch with me to say keep going you can do this and once that happens you can't really give up because other people are then you know depending on you to keep going and 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 to keep them going so um so yeah, it was it was a long haul, and and I, I still deal with anxiety now. It's not it's not something that you that you ever walk away from. But doing those sports was the beginning of a completely new life for me. So we want to thank our sponsor, Athletic Brewing, for promoting a healthy lifestyle through making some of the world's best non-alcoholic craft beer. They make excellent tasting NA for healthy, active, modern adults. They use certified all-organic grains, and each can of non-alcoholic beer is only between 50 and 70 calories. They have IPA, golden ale, stouts, and tons of seasonal offerings. And recently, they actually just took home the gold medal at the U.S. Open Beer Championships for their Double Hop IPA. If you would like to get your hands on some, you can save 15% by using the code ADVENTURE at athleticbrewing.com. Athletic Brewing, the best tasting way to keep your promises. And I also want to thank our sponsor, CS Instant Coffee, for making this show happen. They make 100% Arabica Instant Coffee. They use compostable packaging, and each package makes about 20 ounces of coffee. So I'll take one of those with me on an overnight trip, and it makes two pretty good-sized cups of coffee. And it's an awesome feeling knowing I can just throw that in my backpack, find some hot water, and I'm good to go. Save 20% by using the code ADVENTURE at csinstant.coffee. So after the segment where you were learning all the new sports, which mm-hmm. I, I find fascinating, I think it's just wonderful what you did. Thank but you. But then you you moved into the jobs that children want program. <laughs> so explain yeah. this one for us. As, yeah, I was in a lot of schools at that point. Um, after the two years of doing the sports, and uh, people really getting to know that 
what I was dealing with and the confidence issues and things, a lot of schools asked me to go in and just talk to their young people about how beneficial sports can be. So to try and encourage those those young people that, that weren't very active to just give it a try. So they were always, all the kids were always, you know what they're like, they, they want to tell you about what they're going to do when they grow up. And they were telling me all these things, these amazing jobs. And um, I had always wanted to be a writer, but I'd never, I'd never lost the, the dream of doing it. I'd never lost the, the desire for it. I'd lost the confidence. I'd lost um, that childish ambition that you can do anything you know when you're five and you feel like you can you can rule the world and I just I'd let the world tell me that I that I couldn't do that and that wouldn't be me and I thought why don't I try all these amazing jobs that young people want to do and just prove to them that there's no reason for them to stop dreaming there's no reason to just because you're from um, Glasgow has has high levels of deprivation, particularly mm. in the East End where I live. And I just thought, you know, let's let's raise the aspirations of children. Let's tell them that they can do anything that they want to do. Because if this absolute fool with no skills can do these jobs, then surely they can. Well, and you did write a book. <laughs> yes. I told you I was gonna I was gonna make you talk about it. So oh, the name don't. of the book was. Let's see, I have it written down here. Uh, the book is Between the Lines, uh-huh. <laughs> and it's on Amazon. Is that right? It is, but I really don't want people to read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell them how you did it because it's so cool. How clever! I um, I started off with writer as um, as dream job number one because I thought you can't be a hypocrite. You can't tell people that they can do their dream jobs without trying yours first. And I'd always made the excuse that I didn't have time to write a book you know oh, life's too busy I don't have time so what I did was I took a week off of everything I took a week off work and I wrote a book from start to finish in a week so it was 94 hours it took me and a lot of cake and a lot of tea and caffeine <laughs> and, and I just I wouldn't spend your time reading it <laughs> if I were you um that's thank you for bringing that up <laughs> Please don't read it, Kurt. You'll lose all respect for me. No, you know what? Here's the the reason I bring it up is because it was a huge challenge for you. And people understand the parameters now. You told them you wrote a book in a week. Really? <laughs> can you do that? But I know that you people can. are going to want to say, well, how did it turn out? I mean, <laughs> no one expects that if you wrote a book in 94 hours, it's going to be your best work. Right. I, I hope not. Yeah, <laughs> really, it's really not. I've never, I've never read it back. Um, I, I think my husband proofread it, and then we just put it out there because I didn't want to add to the time. You know, I thought if I'm saying it's done in 94 hours, then it has to be done in 94 hours. So, um, so we just got it out there, and and I do sometimes get emails from Amazon saying that people have bought it, and I feel really bad for <laughs> for them. <laughs> you should just put a big. Yeah, put a big <laughs> note on Amazon that says, do not buy this book, and you'll probably sell a thousand more copies. <laughs> It'll become a bestseller. <laughs> that's right. And it might, because people love to to see something that's raw and real. How about that? <laughs> well, it's definitely that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to ask, you were on TEDx Glasgow. Yes, I was. And uh, it says on your website here that you were readying yourself for the scariest five minutes of your life. <laughs> so how did that go? It was absolutely incredible. It was one of the most surreal days of of my life because I couldn't I genuinely couldn't speak to one person at a time before. You know, five years ago, there's no way I would have spoken to you. I would have um maybe said hi in the passing, but but that's it. I once I once went to a book group to try and <laughs> to try and challenge myself back in the day. And they asked me to to say what I liked about a book and I fainted. So I, you know I blacked out because I was mm. so scared. So doing a TEDx talk to eight hundred people in a in a theatre in, in Glasgow should have been absolutely terrifying and it was I was really shaking and things but once I got that that first reaction out of out of the audience that first that first tiny laugh I thought these people are on these people are on board with me they they understand that that I'm anxious that I'm nervous and that I'm standing up here just trying to make things better for other people and and they really got behind it and um, and enjoyed the story I think which which just really um, bolstered me and Honestly, I was I was as high as a kite for the rest for the rest of that week. I was so excited, but it was one of the most incredible experiences. Mm, that's so cool, so cool. So you tried a lot of different dream jobs. As an example yep. to the kids, you know, dream your dream and go get it. So 
What sorts of things did you do? So I was an opera singer for a day with Scottish Opera. Um, I I sing like a cat's choir. I'm a terrible singer. But I, did <laughs> <laughs> I was a computer games designer. I was a pilot for a day. Um, I was an, a vet, a farmer. I taught in a, a primary school here for a day. I was a r- rally driver, um, a police officer for a day. Um, yeah, firefighter, paramedic astronaut I don't know if I mentioned that one um yeah so it was it was pretty crazy but just so inspiring to meet all these people that were doing these incredible jobs and to then be able to take that back to schools and to young people and say look this is me doing this there is no reason I'm the same as you there is no reason you can't do it um it was I, I just feel really blessed and privileged to be able to do that so if people want more information about how these adventures went right? Being something, mm-hmm. the dream job for a day. How can they get more information about that? PaulaMustTryHarder.co.uk is my website and there's a blog section on there and you can just trawl the archive. I promise you, if, if you don't like one, there'll be something that you like because I've done so many ridiculous things. It'll at least make you laugh. I promise you that. Oh yeah. Really, really cool. I, I love what you've done here and I love it that you're sharing it with the world because, you know, overcoming these things for yourself Well, that's very important, but you're actually overcoming these things for everybody now because people are getting so much encouragement from you through your blog and through events like being on the Adventure Sports Podcast. Thank you for that. That's cool. Not at all. Thank you so much. It started off, and I always say this, it started off a really, really selfish thing. I was just trying to make a better life for myself and for my family who were really struggling and really suffering um, because of what I was going through. And it's become this thing that's so much bigger than myself. And and now I'm, it sounds silly, but I'm really, really thankful for those tough 30 years of anxiety because it's put me in a position now that I can empathise and um, share my experiences with people who are really struggling with it and, and maybe don't think there is a way out for them. So now I can I can say to them, you know, I've been there. I've, you know, it, it's it's been 30 years of my life, um, but you can, you can get through it and I will help you get through it in any way that I can. And I feel really thankful for those, those difficult years because it's put me in this position now. Well, and you do a, a fair amount of public speaking now in schools, different media presentations, not just uh, TEDx, but uh, keynote speaking, motivational speaking. Um, share yeah. a little bit of, of what your experience has been with that. Yeah, that when you even when you read that out, it doesn't sound like me. You know, <laughs> it is now. It is now. <laughs> I'm naming really... you just a little bit. You are a public speaker. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I do a lot of, as you say, motivational speaking and things because people do love um, a good story. We are, we are built for stories we love people's stories that's why we love film and and you know books and things and people do seem to really like the fact that it is a difficult story that they're hearing but there's a light at the end of it um, and I'm standing in front of them and yeah maybe I sound a bit nervous and I move around a lot because I've got a lot of nervous energy but everyone in that audience will know someone who is um, struggling with with mental health, and if I can go up there and say one thing that touches them, then it's it's worth that. It's worth those butterflies in my stomach and the you know the <laughs> the nausea before I go up. So now I do lots of um, charity speaking, and um, I'm on like the BBC radio and things a lot, just talking about anxiety and and different aspects of it, and and how you can get out there and particularly in Scotland, you know, get out, just go for a walk, clear your head and how much difference even just that little thing can make. So do you think this is one of your dream jobs as well? <laughs> it is now, I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's the kind of job that I've ended up in and I don't know I don't know how I've ended up in it, but um but I'm really, really thankful for for any opportunities that I get these days to to just touch people and reach out to people. Well, let's go to one of those dream jobs. If you can pick one, maybe two, let, let's let's hear what it was like for you to go out and be a pilot for a day, for example. I'm so glad you picked pilot because that was one of the best days. Oh, good. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. I went down to England. I don't know if you you know of the, the Red Arrows, they're the Royal Air Force's display team. Well, I their... saw pictures on your site. I can say that much. Yeah. Um, so... 
I went to visit a team called the Blades and they're all um, aerobatic pilots. So they've all been in the, the Royal Air Force and now they, they do all the display shows and the air shows and things like that. So they kindly allowed me to go up in one of these high performance aerobatic planes and we we did some loops and we did some barrel rolls and at one point we flew straight up into the air cut the engine and fell back down twisting into the smoke um it was just one of the most exhilarating things that I've ever experienced and then the pilot kindly gave me control and let me fly loops. So we were going upside down and I was flying it. So it was just, to be given that responsibility was a bit scary, but um, but it was just incredible. And the whole time I was just smiling from ear to ear. I think my face was sore for the, for the rest of the week. Mm. I, I want to rewind. You're the same person that took three months to get the courage to ride a bicycle? <laughs> Is that right? That's me. <laughs> yeah, and then in a day, you're flying upside down in an airplane? <laughs> yeah. You see, it's that, this is why I really struggle sometimes to, to remember that, that this is my life now. I sometimes call old Paula old Paula because it doesn't really feel like there's a join between old Paula and new Paula these days. Um, I have to sometimes sit down and remind myself that, that that's the case. Mm, wow. Well, doing adventurous things and, and even just trying a, a new job, trying to write a book in a week, you know, that sort of thing, that's very adventurous, right? But it sounds yeah. like this totally, totally changed your life. It completely, I, I say this um, and it sounds really glib or maybe like a cliche, but adventure saved my life. I do not think that I would be, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here speaking to you, but I don't even think that I would be sitting here today if I hadn't learned to cycle. Um, that small act, that small thing that, you know, people take for granted that they can do and people um, people learn as a, as a kid to do, that saved me. That made, that made my life something that was worth living. And um, I don't think that you can overestimate that I think that's underestimated sorry I don't you know that's for me that was just um it was the smallest change that made the biggest difference and I'm just so thankful for it there's someone listening right now Paula who they're saying to to themselves himself herself there's they're saying well I'm glad that worked out for her there's no way for me I I, yeah. I don't think you know I don't know how she did that that's it's that's not you know, what's going to happen for me. What do you say to that person? I say that I would absolutely never suggest that, you know, throwing yourself out of plane is the the first response to anxiety. You know, I would never say that. I had a long road of going down the medical route and therapy and counselling, and those things stabilised me. Those things got me through a lot of really difficult times. And I would always say that's your first port of call go and see someone and the biggest thing is talk about it we can't we can't cure any of the biggest illnesses in the world by talking about them but we can make a huge dent in anxiety by just talking about it and we don't we are so desperate to to show that we're strong and that we can cope and that there's no chink in our armor you know that we that we are that we're tough and there are so many of us that are struggling with anxiety the only reaction that I've ever had since I've started speaking about anxiety is how can I help you or me too because so many people people that you know day to day people that you think are the most confident the most well together um you know successful people that you know will be dealing with something they will be dealing with nerves or anxiety or depression or something or they know someone who is no one looks at you as if you are weak if you talk about anxiety so what I would say is before you start <laughs> taking up all the sports or just talk to someone that you trust about it. And I promise you that they will, they, that will make such a difference. And if you don't have anyone, talk to me because, you know, I am so happy that I get emails every day now, you know, from people saying, I love what you've done. I don't know how it translates to my life. Can you give me some tips? And I'm, I'm, more than happy to open up a dialogue with anybody that's that's struggling because if that makes a difference then then everything that I've done's been worth it you know i'm not I'm not afraid to share Paula that 
as you were saying that I, I had some memories of my own when I was uh, a teenager. Yeah. I, I had anxiety as well. And I remember one day my mom wanted me to just put gas in the car. I was too terrified. I did it, but I was shaking. I was terrified to put gas or petrol, right, in mm -hmm. the car. Yeah, petrol. <laughs> and, and so it sounds ridiculous because that's something we do every day, right? But for me, th that was such a challenge for similar reasons that you've already described. I was too anxious to go into the back of the house alone. Yeah. My own mm -hmm. house. <laughs> it sounds it sounds crazy, but it, it, it happens to so many people. It's, yeah, I think it's, it's a really condition common. that pe so many people are 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 dealing with and it is really common and I think that the sooner that we that we understand that and the sooner that we just give each other a little bit of a hand up, um the better that we'll all be. Well, you know what I have to share this last part too. My sister's name is also Paula. <laughs> and she was very outgoing and gregarious and just a delightful mm. person. And she was a couple of years older than I was. And she showed me that you really could reach out and do things. And so during the time that I was so anxious, I couldn't even put gas in the car. She was running for student council president. She was drum major leading the band. She was, you know, out there doing these things. Wow. And the way that I overcame all of that was mm -hmm. to follow in her footsteps. So I became class president. I became the drum major that led the band. And wow. And it, it worked. It's kind of like what you were doing, you know, as you were trying all the different things that were scary to you. Well, I did the same thing. I never even thought of that before the interview, but we have kind of that in common, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it amazing. works. It absolutely it works. It does. I think it just gives you an, a, the ability to put fear into context and put fear into its place. Fear is really natural. It's, um, it's a really human response and we all have it. And, you know, it's it's good for us, but I had no perspective over what should be scary and what shouldn't because I'd never taken manageable risks when I was young. So I'd never let myself go out and fall off a bike and realise that that's okay because nothing bad's going to happen. So I didn't have any context for fear. So the telephone ringing was as scary for me as, you know, being chased by a lion I just didn't know what I should be frightened of wow. and what I shouldn't anymore um, and once you give yourself that context back once you try those things that that scare you but that you know deep inside that aren't really putting you at that much risk such as cycling um, you give yourself that context back and you take control back over the fear and put it back in its place and then it has to live with you rather than you living with it yeah yeah. So then your next step, we have to move on to the Adventure Week <laughs> program, right? So yep. tell us about that. So for about, it, it was meant to be a year, but it ended up about 18 months. Every single week, I took on a new adventure, a new skill, learned a new, um, went to a new club, or just tried something a bit different. And at the time, I was writing a column for, for a national paper in, in Scotland. So I wrote about the adventures and tried to get other people to to try them as well. So that was that was a really cool job for a while that I did. Um and, and it, it just I got to try some of the coolest things that I've that I've ever tried over that year and a half. Well let's let's hear some of them. Give us a I don't know, a handful. There's so many. So run down the list. So I tried things like flying trapeze, um I tried roller skating, I tried um, gliding and paragliding. I tried land yachting. Um, I tried kayaking and horse vaulting. Um, so doing gymnastics on the back of a, a moving horse. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, which was one of the, the strangest things that I've ever done. I'd never I'd never met a horse before then. So um, <laughs> to get on its back and and do um, do some gymnastics was a bit a bit strange. Um, I did abseiling bungee jumping, I did um, pottery, I did <laughs> electric mountain biking, I climbed Ben Nevis, which is the highest peak in, in Britain. Um, yeah, I did fire walking, beekeeping, indoor and outdoor skydiving. I was a life model for a day. So I went to an <laughs> artist class and and took my clothes off and let them draw me for, okay, for a day. So um, how does yeah. someone with fear of people do that? <laughs> it, 
honestly, that was that is something that I will never be re- recreating. Never in my, <laughs> I never say, I never say never. But I will not be doing that again. I was, I was vomiting that morning. I was so Aww. sick to my stomach. It was two and a half hours, I think, that I had to I had to sit. Um, and at the start, it's there's something called dynamic poses. So you have to look like you're doing something. So it was, I was pretending that I was playing tennis and, um, you know, mowing the lawn and things and just completely naked. It was the most awful, <laughs> awful experience. And people around you in a circle. So someone's always getting the bad angle, basically. <laughs> so, so there was all these, I think there was 200 sketches of me by the end of the day by complete strangers. And I did not like, any of them (laughs) they were awful and they were so proud of them they were saying come and see come and see and I just wanted to run screaming from (laughs) from the Uh, hall but here's the thing and and there's there's a kind of a metaphor about this isn't there when when we have anxiety we hide we hide from everybody and what you've done is you've said there's nothing left to hide it's all out there now (laughs) Yeah, it was exactly that. It was exactly that. And that was the first one in the the year and a half of An Adventure a Week was Life Modeling was the first one because I just thought, you know, I will keep putting this one off unless I just do it. And that's what I do now. If if I know that I'm frightened of something, I'll just go out and do it straight away. If there's a phone call that I don't want to make, I'll do it right now. Because if I give myself time for that fear response to kick in, then it will take over. But if I don't give it time and I just go and do it, then, um, then it's always less difficult than I think it's going to be. Well, and I've seen so many people when they try bungee jumping, right? Yeah. The, the people that help with bungee jumping know this, so they try to get people to go right away. <laughs> don't stand yeah. up there and think about it. How was that for you? It was it was an incredible rush. I've never been scared of heights, but I'm terrified of water. And I did it, um, it was in the Perthshire countryside, absolutely gorgeous scenery. And it was from under, the underside of a bridge over a river. So I was jumping basically towards something that really, really scared me, which mm. was water. Um, so yeah, I had to do it just, they said, who wants to go first? And my hand shot up because I thought, just get that. Don't watch anyone else. Just get it done. Um, and as you say, you just walk to the end. They say three, two, one, and you just, you just go. And, and that moment that you're just in free fall thinking, is this rope going to catch me? <laughs> is this going to kick in at any point? Um, and then it just, you know, it just reaches the end and bounces you back up. And it was, it was incredible. And once you've done it, you want to do it. You want to do it again and again and again. Wow. So there are a lot of metaphors we can make out of that one too, but you know <laughs> My what, life is a metaphor. What is that leap of faith like? Okay, I believe that someone engineered this correctly. Everything's going to work and we're going to go. <laughs> yeah, you just have to hope because there's different ropes for different sizes of people, different weights of people. So they weigh you a few times before before you go up. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, I hope that they, I hope they've hooked me up to the right <laughs> the right one because if they've not, I could end up in the water or I could end up bouncing right back up onto the like onto the bridge. So you just really have to put your, your trust in the systems that are in place and just go for it because um there's nothing else once once you're attached to the you know it's it's on your legs, that's you. You're you're done. You just need to go. Um, and it was wonderful. As everything is once you've done it. I think I would have to ask the the people helping out how many single malts they had the night before. <laughs> I would just have to I would have to know before I jump. <laughs> That's too dangerous a question in Scotland. Listen, you just don't ask. You don't ask. You don't want to know. <laughs> oh. Wow. It sounds so amazing. It really, really does. And you have a big event that's coming up. So let's talk about the future now. You've done so much. I wish we could dive into everyone a lot more. But (laughs) what are you planning? So next April, I am planning to attempt to be the first person ever to have swam the entire way around the coast of mainland Britain. (laughs) And I only swim swim all the way around. All the way around. I only learned to swim three weeks ago. Wow. Are you a swimmer? (laughs) I I learned to swim three weeks ago. (laughs) <laughs> Three weeks ago. Okay. Yes. Uh, so there's got to be a lot going on here. So I love this. People like to start a new sport, and they always don't know how to start and how to get from where they, you know, where they are to where they want to be. But, I mean, you set a goal out there that's amazing. That's huge. <laughs> I mean, you've heard of people trying to do the English Channel, and, and somehow it's yeah. tough. But you're going to do a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah. So um, talk, talk th- about the process a little bit. What made you decide to take this on? 
to put it into context a little, um, I have been trying to learn to swim for the last five years since the since the sports challenge because swimming was one of one of the sports. I've been aquaphobic all my life, absolutely terrified of large bodies of water. I scalded myself with boiling hot water when I was about mm. 18 months old. And it, while I don't remember it, it's manifested itself in this huge fear of, of open water and large bodies of water. So I couldn't walk over a bridge. I couldn't go near any of our beautiful Scottish locks. I couldn't, um, I couldn't really even go near very big puddles and things. I, I was terrified of water. So this has been quite a long process to get me to the point that, as I say, three weeks ago, I finally put the breathing into my into my stroke and now I can actually call myself a swimmer. But it's it's the last big remaining fear that I have. I've never I've never swum in the sea. Um I, I will go into the sea before the challenge, please don't worry. Um but it just when it came to me this idea of of swimming around Britain and I looked into it and saw that no one had ever even attempted it. To me, that's just, you know, that's a red rag to a bull. You, if no one's attempted it, you have to go and try, don't you? So, um, and it was one of those things that, and you've probably heard this from from loads of, you know, your, your adventurers that you've spoken to, once an idea comes to you and it won't leave, you know that you have to do it. So right. I woke up, I would wake up in the morning thinking about it. I would go to sleep at night thinking about it. And pretty much every hour in between, I was thinking about it. And I just, it, it just stuck. And as soon as I, I spoke to Jerry about it and he said, okay, let's do it. Um, I knew that, that this was the one, this was the one for me. Mm. So when are you attempting this? I'm starting next April um, and I'm starting at, Land's End, which is the most southwesterly point of Britain, so it's down um, down in England. So I'm starting there because of the the water temperature will be a lot will be a lot warmer down in the south of England than it would be if I started up in Scotland. So um, and then I'm just going to chase the summer up and round up and round Britain. And it's still going to be cold <laughs> in April, oh, yeah. even at Land's End. It's <laughs> going to be cold. Yeah, I think it'll probably be about ten degrees the water. Ooh. So um, yeah, but. You know, I live in Scotland. I'm I'm used to the cold, so um, yeah, I've been doing some some open water swimming since over the last couple of weeks, and I'm I'm getting getting used to it now. And I'm just going to keep swimming over the winter, so that by the time April comes, I'll hopefully be acclimatized acclimatized to it. Right. So, how long do you think it'll take to make your way? It should hopefully take about six months, and that's swimming in every single tide that I possibly can swim in. Obviously, there'll be some tides that you don't swim against the tide. There's there's a metaphor there, and um, so there'll be tides that I'll have to wait out. So it, hopefully, it'll be five hours swimming, and then you know a break of maybe about seven hours waiting out the, the tide, and then another five hours swimming. So it's basically just going to be sleeping and swimming on shifts for six months. Oh. So. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you're going to try to do this every day for six months? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, um, we, I, live, I live in Britain. The weather is is not predictable in any way. So there will be bad weather days where um, it just won't be safe to go out. And I, I'm taking a lot of risk. Obviously, it's a risky challenge, but um, I'm going to mitigate all the risk that I possibly can. And, and I wouldn't I wouldn't go out on days when I'm advised not to. So there will be days when when I, would, I just won't be able to. So I'll, I'll take those as rest days and food calorie intake days uh, and every other day that I can possibly swim, I will be. And are you using a, a follow boat, someone to be there if, if things go wrong? Yes, there'll definitely be a support boat and possibly a kayaker alongside me. I've had lots of lovely kayakers get in touch to say that they would that they would love to, to do the journey with me. So there might be a bit of a kayak really going around Britain for, for six months next year, just of them um, keeping me safe, but also feeding and watering me <laughs> as we go along. So um, I've had lots of people reaching out, which is great. <laughs> That's really, really fun. Um Forrest Gump, the movie, you remember when he mm-hmm. decides to run and he just keeps running and the next thing you know, there's a, there's a huge crowd running with him. I think this could happen. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I really hope so. It's lovely because um, open water swimming has become so um, so popular now. And in Scotland, there's there's loads of clubs in, in England as well, in Wales, there's loads of clubs that that do open water swimming and most of them have got in touch to say you know we will keep track of of where you're you're going to be and we'll send all our swimmers out and they'll do a couple of miles with you and I think that will really keep me going just meeting the new people and and knowing that there's people out there that are 
that are supporting me, that'll that'll make the six months seem hopefully a little bit shorter. Mm. How, how amazing. And you have a Kickstarter campaign. Yes, um, the the challenge is called the Big Mad Swim around Britain because it's for it's for mental health. It's to raise awareness of living adventurous and active and healthy, engaged lives with anxiety and mental health challenges. So that is called the Big Mad Swim around Britain, and there's a Kickstarter for for the documentary film of of the six month trip. So it won't just be me swimming all the time there will <laughs> there will be other things shown there'll be lovely there'll be lovely scenery and things it won't just be you know focused on just my swim there'll be there'll be lots of other things in it so a documentary um mm-hmm. and you said big mud is that right mad m-a-d as in crazy m-a-d i'm sorry so that the uh the call cut out just a little bit when you said it oh, okay. two times it cut out both times for <laughs> no. me anyway the big mad so that's what people would search for on Kickstarter to find your campaign. Yes, the big mad swim around Britain, um, or just search for my name and swim around Britain because no one else has done it, so they should find me. Paula McGuire, this is such a fun thing. So, when does the Kickstarter <laughs> campaign start? It has already started, so um, and it will run for about sixty days. So you have time, and there's lots of really cool rewards, things like you know getting a postcard from me all the way all the way around Britain, or um, you know having had a pair of my my sweaty goggles when I come <laughs> back, or, um, or me visiting you and and um, giving a talk about anxiety and adventure. So hopefully people will get behind it because um, the cause I hope is is a good one, and and if if one person sees me doing this and and thinks yeah I'm going to I'm going to take up running again or I'm going to go out swimming again, then yeah, it's, it's totally worth the the six months of hardship. Wow. What kind of challenges besides just making the distance, what kind of challenges do you anticipate for this swim? I think that um, the cold water will obviously be a big one. Um, as I say, I'm Scottish, so we're used to the cold, but, um, but prolonged periods of the cold will be, be really, really difficult. Also, I'll have to be taking in about eight thousand calories a day. Now, normally that wouldn't <laughs> that wouldn't bother me. I'm quite happy to eat, um, but it will be difficult to take in that amount of calories around swimming. So, um, so that will be quite difficult. And I think mostly it will be. I truly believe that you can train yourself to do pretty much anything. Uh, I know that you have lots of incredible endurance athletes on your show and, and I think, how did you do that? That's amazing. But you can you can train your body to do things. Um, I think it will be the mental side of things that will be difficult. Hopefully I've put myself in a really good position now that uh, I can I can cope with it, that I can talk myself around from panic and I know I know my triggers and I, I know when I when I need to step back from things and um, so that that might be a challenge, being in my own head for for that length of time, but um, but I think I'm in a good place place to deal with that. And I, I'm told that no one has ever been um, bitten by a shark or eaten by a shark off the coast of Britain. So, um, <laughs> so that that could be a record that I go for. Yeah, let's not well. let's not achieve that one. Okay. <laughs> but it will it will be. Um, I'll, if if I manage when I manage all the way round, I'll be the first person ever to have done it. Uh, and one. One adventurer, Sean Conway, who's an incredible adventurer, he swam Land's End to John O'Groats. So that's one coast of Britain. He did that in 2013 and he's been a great supporter of my challenge. He's He's been on the phone telling me um, lots of things to watch out for and um, and has been great. So, But I will be the first woman to have to have swam that, that section as well. So there's a few records that I'm hopefully going to be going for. Right on. That That is really, really fun. Well, we need to have you back on afterwards. So that you can tell us that. how it went. That would be so fun. I would love that so much. Um, I'm sure that I will have lots of stories. Um, hopefully most of them will be good stories to tell you when, when I get back. Right. Well, you know, I, a lot of people think of swimming as, you know, what they do in the pool or maybe in the lake. But when you're out in the ocean like that with the currents and the tides and all yeah. sorts of manners of, of weather and waves, and it's going to be... Very interesting. You're going to have yeah. a, a lot of different experiences. Yeah, um, and I am, as I say, I'm mitigating all the risks that I possibly can. I will have a support team, and I have a fantastic um, swimming 
director, if you like, up here, um, Robert, who deals with all the open water swimming events in, in Scotland. So he runs he runs a company here called Figure Events and they do all the, the lock swimming and the outdoor swims that that happen and most of the ones that happen in Scotland. So he's great. He's been in um, swimming since for about 30 years and he has all that information that I just that I just don't know. So um so he's a he's a great support for me and um has told me lots of things that I need to watch out for and he'll be with me for for the journey as well. So I'm I'm really lucky that so many people are are getting involved and sending me advice and things and I'm I'm willing to take the advice of anyone that that is willing to help. Mm. Wow. Well, we've run out of time, Paula. I would love to hear more <laughs> the clock goddess, but you know what? Let's one more time tell people how they can learn more. If they go to Paula Must Try Harder dot co dot uk or just Google Paula Must Try Harder, it'll pop up. <laughs> yeah, there's only one of one of them. Um, or I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at P Must Try Harder, um, and the Kickstarter will be the Big Mad Swim around Britain. If you look for that, and I'd love your support. Thank you. Big Mad Swim around Britain. <laughs> That's it. Okay, that's that's wonderful. So, you know, I have to say a heartfelt thank you for what you did today. I think that what you shared with us is going to help so many people. And like I said at the beginning of the show, I don't care how tough you are and how much you like to pretend that you have it all together. This show has something for you. Everybody has challenges to overcome. And I love the way that you have used adventurous events, adventure sports, and things like that to overcome your challenge, your special challenges with anxiety. And it's a real example for the rest of us. Um, thank you thank for you stepping so out and doing that. You didn't have to do that, you know, but you did. <laughs> and, and it's changing lives. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. That's so kind of you of you to say. Um, I'm just really, really feel really fortunate to be able to speak about it. And it's lovely of you to give me the platform to, to hopefully speak to, speak to people about, about, as you see, overcoming challenges. Oh, sure. It's our pleasure. Absolutely our pleasure. pleasure. And thank you so much for being on the Adventure Sports Podcast today. And for all the listeners out there, wow. You know, I always say get out there and have some fun. But can you imagine <laughs> getting out there and changing your life by trying fun things and then sharing it with others and making an impact on the world, you know? That, that might be what it's all about. So get out there. Have some fun. Well, first of all, thank you so much for listening to this episode. It really means the world to us that you want to spend your time with us. If you'd like to help us further, please just leave us a review on iTunes. Share us on social media. Tell your friends about us. You can become a patron, a supporter of the show for $5 a month at patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast and if you know somebody that would make a good guest reach out we're always looking for good adventure and outdoor stories and lastly thank you to our sponsors whose messages follow right now athletic brewing makes the best non-alcoholic craft beer go to their website at athleticbrewing.com and use the code in our show notes to save 15 percent on your first order after all this adventure talk, if you're needing some gear yourself, but you need some advice before buying, go to backpacktribe.com where you can ask questions to the owners who have experience with all the gear as well as all of it for sale right there on their website.